In Robotics 1, we focused almost entirely on three degree of freedom manipulators. Three degrees of freedom is a good choice for number of degrees of freedom for manipulators because that's the minimum number of degrees of freedom, or joints, that is required for the end effector to have a three-dimensional workspace. In Robotics 1, we looked at several of the standard types of these three degree of freedom manipulators. Things like the Scara manipulator or the Articulated manipulator. When we look at robotic manipulators commonly used in industry, we will find that many of them match these standard forms. Scara or Articulated Cartesian and so forth. However, we will often find that the number of degrees of freedom, that is the number of joints, is not limited to three. In fact, many of these manipulators have as many as six degrees of freedom. In this first section of class, we're going to learn why this is. Why is six degrees of freedom a good number to choose for your manipulators? And how can this be accomplished? In particular, how can we accomplish building a six degree of freedom manipulator while also still avoiding kinematic redundancy? To answer this question, let's start by taking a look at some of these manipulators that have as many as six degrees of freedom. Here I'm showing you a six degree of freedom manipulator moving around. As you watch this manipulator move, it might look like it's very complicated, but in fact, if we look carefully, we can see that it's actually just two pieces of individual manipulators stuck together. I'm going to pause the video here for a moment and point something out here. Let's wait until the manipulator gets down into a better position. Pause it. This joint right here, combined with this joint here, and this joint right here, together make an articulated manipulator, a three degree of freedom manipulator that we've learned about previously. Stuck to the end effector of this manipulator is an additional three joints. I'm going to rewind a bit so you can see this happening again. So here we're seeing the articulated part of this manipulator move, and now here is the additional three joints at the end of this manipulator. Those three additional joints have a name of their own. They're called a spherical wrist. Many six degree of freedom manipulators are actually made by taking one of our standard three degree of freedom manipulators and then sticking on the end a spherical wrist. Let's take a moment and look at the kinematic diagram of a spherical wrist and then we'll go back to this video and see if you can see the spherical wrist on this robot manipulator. I'm going to draw for you here the kinematic diagram of a spherical wrist. It starts out with a revolute joint and I'm also going to draw in the axis of rotation for this revolute joint. Now the next joint is also revolute. However, the second joint has its axis of rotation perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the first one. So here's the axis of rotation going into and out of the board for the second joint. Then the third joint is also revolute. and its axis of rotation is perpendicular to the second 
joints axis of rotation. The way I've drawn this kinematic diagram has the axis of rotation of the third joint being collinear with the axis of rotation of the first joint. But this will not always be true. And to show you how that is, I'm going to redraw this kinematic diagram with this second joint rotated 90 degrees down. So if we have the first joint here, and then we have the second joint with its axis of rotation perpendicular, and then if we would draw the third joint here, the third joint would look like this. So if I now draw in the axes of rotation of all three joints, the first axis of rotation is here, the second axis of rotation is perpendicular to the first one, and the third axis of rotation, you can see now, is actually perpendicular to both the axis of rotation of the first joint and the second joint. Now, the way that I drew the kinematic diagram at first over here makes it look like the spherical wrist is kinematically redundant as if the rotation of this first joint is the same as the rotation of the third joint. But when I draw the kinematic diagram as shown in this second picture, you can see that this is not true. The rotation of the first joint rotates like this, and the rotation of the third joint rotates like that. With this combination of three revolute joints, you can rotate the end effector of a manipulator to any rotation you may choose. In fact, that is the reason why we would add a spherical wrist onto the end of a manipulator. With a three degree of freedom manipulator, we have a three-dimensional workspace. We can choose the X, Y, and Z position of the end effector. However, we cannot control the rotation or orientation of the end effector. The ability to control the rotation or orientation of the end effector can sometimes be very important, especially if you are doing some kind of manufacturing task like painting, or grinding or cutting, the ability to decide in what direction the end effector will be pointed once it's positioned in the correct location can be very important. Now, with this kinematic diagram in mind, let's look back again at the video that we had of the six degree of freedom manipulator moving around. Let's see if we can see these three joints at the end of our manipulator. Here's the rotation of the first joint of the spherical wrist. Go back here. Here is the rotation of the second joint. Let's see if we can see the third one. The third rotation is out here with this right there with the device at the end. Now that we've seen a spherical wrist in action, let's take a look mathematically at the reasons why we would use a spherical wrist. I'm going to start by drawing my spherical wrist kinematic diagram again. I'm going to draw it in this kind of a position so that we can more easily distinguish the coordinate frames for each of the joints. Now I'm going to draw coordinate frames on each of these joints. I'm going to make sure that I follow the right hand rule and that Z is always the axis of rotation. And then after I follow those rules, X and Y are a free choice. 
for the end effector, I'm going to copy frame two. Now, the spherical wrist is generally attached at the end of a three degree of freedom manipulator. In this derivation that I'm showing you, we're ignoring the rest of the arm. After we do this, we'll stick the spherical wrist at the end of a complete manipulator and we'll look at the complete homogeneous transformation matrix all the way from the base frame to the end effector frame. But for now, we're just going to do the part with uh, the spherical wrist. Now the next thing I'll do is I'm going to draw in these joint variables. One thing I'm not going to do now is go back and label the link lengths. The reason that I'm going to ignore the link lengths is because when we build a spherical wrist, we're going to try as much as possible to make the centers of each of these joints be at the exact same location. Now that's not always physically possible. Sometimes you need to have some physical distance between these joints. But most of the time we're going to try and design this so that the centers are all in the same location. And we will be learning as the class goes on why it's beneficial to us to try and make the centers of these joints as much as possible all in the same location. So if I have the centers of these joints actually physically in the same location, that means that these link lengths which I've drawn in my kinematic diagram actually don't exist. They're just drawn here to help my diagram look in such a way that I can derive equations from it. In other words, the displacement from zero to one should actually be zero in x, zero in y, and z zero in z. And the same with the other displacements as well. So in order to find the homogeneous transformation matrix, I really only care about the rotations. Because all three of these are revolute joints, the rotation matrix for each of the three homogeneous transformation matrices will all start out with a rotation of theta around Z. Then the second part of this matrix is the part that accounts for the difference in orientation between the two frames. So since my x1 axis is in the same direction as x0, the first column will look like this. Then since y1 is in the same direction as z, it goes like that. And since Z1 is the opposite direction as Y0, we get a vector like that. And I'm going to go ahead and do this multiplication right away. I'm going to take this frame, or this matrix that we just figured out here, and I'm going to set it aside. Ultimately, I want to figure out the rotation, not from zero to one, but from zero all the way to three. And so I know that in order to do that, I'm going to have to multiply together the three individual matrices. So I'm going to record R01 down here, and then I'm going to erase what I did previously so that we have room to find 
the rotation from 1 to 2. So once again, I need to start out with the matrix that is a rotation around z, this time of theta 2. Then the second part of this matrix is going to account for the difference in orientation between 1 and 2. So since x2 is in the opposite direction as z1, we get a first column that looks like that. Then y2 is in the same direction as y1, and z2 is in the same direction as x1. I'm going to multiply these together. Then I'm going to take this matrix, copy it, and I'm going to put it down here. So that's going to be the second thing we're going to have to multiply together to get our R03. Lastly, I need the rotation from 2 to 3. In this case, these two frames are already in the same orientation. So the only part of the rotation matrix that I have is a rotation of theta 3 around z. And we're already done with the rotation from 2 to 3. Now, to find my complete rotation matrix, I need to multiply these three together. I'm going to do that multiplication first by multiplying together these two matrices on the left. Then I still have this matrix on the right that I haven't multiplied, so I'm go going to multiply these two together. It's going to start to get quite messy at this point. This is my first column, so I'm going to draw a dashed line to help us keep track of what is the first column, the second column, and the third column. Here's the second column finished, and the third column is much easier. Now I know this matrix is quite complicated, but I want to point out just a couple of important things about it. First of all, notice that none of these positions in this rotation matrix is zero, and none of them has a value of one. Because none of the values is a constant, that means that any rotation matrix you can come up with can be represented by this rotation matrix. In other words, the spherical wrist can be used to achieve any orientation of the end effector that you can possibly dream up. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples here now. Let's start by looking at the most simple example. Let's suppose that you would like the end effector of the robot to be oriented in the same way that frame 0 is oriented here. In other words, we're saying suppose you want the end effector of the manipulator to be pointed straight out and rotated in the same way that this first joint is rotated. In that case, you would want the rotation matrix to be the identity matrix showing that there is no rotation between the 0 frame and the 3 frame. Could you find the angles theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 that would make this rotation come about? In fact, you could. And here's how we can figure it out. We're going to start with this position down here sine of theta 2. The reason we're going to start with this term is because in this term and this term only, there is only one angle in the term. 
So I'm going to take this value from the rotation matrix we want, and I'm going to set it equal to its equivalent position. In other words, we want the sine of theta 2 to be equal to 1. If we're restricting the angles to all be between 0 and 360 degrees, that means that theta 2 must be equal to 90 degrees. Next, let's pick one of these other elements. And let's plug in 90 for theta 2. The sine of theta 2 is 1. And we know that this whole term needs to be equal to 1 because that's what we have in our target matrix here. Right now, in this term, I have two variables, theta 1 and theta 3. So to solve this equation, I need another equation to go with it. Let's try this one. Once again, I'm going to plug in sine of theta 2 being equal to 1. When we get to our section on inverse kinematics for rotation, we'll learn the general rules for how we can solve this kind of a problem. For now, let's just try some values of theta 1 and theta 3 to see if this would be possible. Let's start out by assuming that theta 1 is 0 and theta 3 is also 0. We want to see if this combination of angles will make these two equations true. So this first equation could not be true if theta 1 and theta 3 were both 0. Let's try making one of the two angles be equal to 90 degrees. For this first term, the cosine of 0 is 1, and the sine of 90 degrees is also 1. For this term, the sine of 0 is 0. So this is still not true. We have negative 1 is equal to 1. So what if we would swap these two and make theta 1 90 and make theta 3 0? The cosine of 90 is 0. The sine of 90 is 1. And the cosine of 0 is also 1. So we still don't quite have it. What if we would make theta 1 be negative 90? The cosine of negative 90 is still 0. But the sine of negative 90 is negative 1. The cosine of 0 is 1. So in this case, we've gotten our 1. Let's check and see if this combination of angles is also true for this other equation. The cosine of negative 90 is 0, so this whole term becomes 0. The sine of negative 90 is negative 1, and the sine of 0 is 0. So this equation is also true. Back in our complete rotation matrix, we will find that if we plug in these angles, theta 2 equals 90, theta 1 equals negative 90, and theta 3 equals 0, every one of these terms will equal what we have specified in our target, R03. If we would go back and pick a different rotation matrix, R03, that we would like to achieve, we will find that we can achieve any rotation matrix with values of theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3 
somewhere between negative 360 and 360. That is why a spherical wrist is so useful for the purpose of making a three degree of freedom manipulator into a six degree of freedom manipulator. With this kind of a setup, we can specify any rotation or orientation of the end effector that we want, and we can achieve it by setting the three angles of our spherical wrist. Now before we finish here, let's try taking a look at a complete six degree of freedom manipulator. Let's use the example of a SCARA manipulator since we have some experience with that from Robotics 1. The SCARA manipulator starts out like this. In order to make our SCARA manipulator into a six degree of freedom manipulator, we don't have to change anything about these first three joints. All we need to do is add on to the end effector the spherical wrist. Our first joint of the spherical wrist will be in line with the last link of the three degree of freedom manipulator. Next, we have another revolute joint whose axis of rotation is perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the first joint. Finally, we have one more revolute joint, which in this configuration is collinear with the axis of rotation of the first joint. However, the axis of rotation of the third joint will not be collinear with the axis of rotation of the first one when the second revolute joint rotates. Now the way I've drawn this here makes it look like the end of the uh, the end effector is far below the first joint. That's just because it takes a lot of space to draw in the spherical wrist. In actuality, this whole spherical wrist would take up only a small amount of space, and the actual base of the manipulator would still be below the end effector, so it might look something more like this. But in practice, this whole spherical wrist is physically much smaller than the rest of the manipulator. Let's draw some coordinate frames on this manipulator. Our coordinate frames will start out the way that they've started out in the past. That is, Z is the axis of rotation, X and Y are free choices, as long as all of the axes follow the right hand rule. For the prismatic joint, Z is the direction of motion. And for the frame on the end effector, I copy frame 5. So you'll notice that now I have a total of 7 frames. And what we would be looking for in this case is the homogeneous transformation matrix from 0 to 6. We would need to find the rotation matrix all the way from 0 to 6, as well as the displacement vector from 0 to 6. 
However, I want to point something out here that will help you in finding this homogeneous transformation matrix with less work. Remember that the way we would find this complete homogeneous transformation matrix would be to multiply together each of the individual matrices, 0 to 1, times 1 to 2, times 2 to 3, and so forth. We would keep doing this all the way until we got to 6. Now, this matrix here, from 0 to 3, this you have a lot of practice finding already because we've done this over and over again with 3 degree of freedom manipulated. And this other part here, from 3 to 6, that's what we just did up here when we looked at the wrist all by itself. So once you've already found the homogeneous transformation matrix from 3 to 6 from the standard spherical wrist, all you have to do is find the homogeneous transformation matrix for your first three joints, just like we've done in the past. And you can multiply together the H03, which we found in the past, times H36, which is what we've already found up here. So you don't need to re-derive the entire rotation matrix for a spherical wrist every time you do this. You can just use the spherical wrist matrix that we've already uh, derived once. That's one of the benefits of using standard manipulators and standard devices like a spherical wrist in your manipulator. You can just use the equations that we have standard for that particular device.